Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly condensed matter physics seminar. Uh, my name is Gang Xiao, and today I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Son, from IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Uh, he has been a research physicist at IBM over the last 25 years, and he's going to talk about a new type of electronics called spintronics, or uh, magnetoelectronics. So IBM actually uh, was always at the frontier of spintronics. Uh, a famous physicist at IBM, John Sronczewski, uh, discovered the quantum magnetic tunneling junction uh, in 1974 in a theoretical proposal, and it was confirmed in 1995. And ever since then, uh, this field has grown uh, and created a lot of new devices and technologies. Uh, IBM has been working on magnetic tunneling junction-based uh, random access memory for the last 25 years. And Jonathan has been associated with IBM for over 20-some years. Uh, he received his uh, PhD degree from uh, Stanford under the supervision of the renowned late physicist Ted Jebo. Yeah. And then after uh, three years uh, of postdoc uh, in, in a superconducting, superconducting uh, technology company, he went to IBM to work on high TC superconductivity and also uh, Josephson junction uh, based uh, systems uh, using high TC. And then he went to work uh, on spintronics. Uh, so he was instrumental in realizing uh, electron spin transfer torque in manipulating magnetic materials, and which made uh, magnet, uh, random access memory a reality. Yeah, so today he's going to speak to us on spin torque and also spin orbit torque. These are two different kinds of concepts. And using these two uh, physical mechanisms, for uh, seeking opportunities and overcome challenges for modern computing. Jonathan. Okay. Thank you, Gang, for this kind introduction. Yeah, it's hard to believe it's 20 something years. I think uh, Gang's very modest. He played a fairly important role in starting the uh, Spintronics and MREM program at, uh, at IBM when you did a sabbatical many years back. We're still remembering that. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, today I'm going to try to give you a flavor of what we've been doing over the last decade or two in trying to integrate uh, magnetic tunnel junction-based technologies into the back end of silicon and making some commercial products out of it and also gaining some insight into the device-related physical processes in physics. So uh, just to sort of get it started, I guess uh, this is a status report. These spin torque based what we call STT, Magnetic Random Access Memory, or MRAM, is now being offered by most of the foundry uh, companies around the world, Samsung, TSMC, Global Foundries, and whatnot. Uh, here's sort of a few headline shots. The roadmap for MRAM from TSMC sees uh, the first application indeed for uh, replacing uh, embedded flash on the logic circuit chip that's happening today. Uh, the next, of course, is you go on to faster memory uh, setups, uh, such as uh, embedded DRAM or SRAM uh, circuits. Uh, technologies, those are, that's how things are done, and they're all facing scaling challenges and new materials coming potentially to save the day. Um, Everspin has also worked, uh, one of the earlier pioneering companies, and offered many generations of both field-switched and spin-torque-switched magnetic memories, and their most, I didn't do that, did I? It, waking, it wakes up. OK, maybe just because I didn't touch it for long. Yeah, I should, I should keep on touching it. So uh, the most recent 
product, for example, I'll just give you a flavor of it, is uh, these MRAM-based uh, GPS receivers that Sony has a chip that went into uh, some of these smartwatches, and also uh, Ambic, Apollo 4, uh, also GPS chip, is based on TSMC's 22 nanometer technology with, a, with our um, technology uh, STT MRAM integrated to the back end of CMOS circuit. And I assume uh, we're familiar with the term back end, which means the silicon happens underneath in the crystalline wafer. And above the oxide insulation, there are a lot of metal levels. That's where you uh, insert the tunnel junctions, and you can do the magic of STT related memory in that level uh, and above. So that's what the word back end means. It's going to be used a lot. So in, in this diagram, for example, that's the, where the MRAM lives on top of a lot of the metal structures already there. That's CMOS technology. So the advantage of this class of memory is you directly put memory behind logic processors as opposed to having to fetch it far away from address lines. Saves you a lot of data shuffling back and forth. Uh, the holy grail, of course, is to replace SRAM, which is very fast but power, relatively power hungry and has large uh, footprint size. And these are much more compact memory structures, but that's our next uh, sort of target. So what enabled all these technologies at the fundamental level that I'm going to spend a few minutes on here today is the so-called spintronics or the spin current related transport physics. And what is a spin current? Uh, for the physicists to crawl, probably I don't need to explain too much. It's similar to the charge current, which we're all familiar with. Basically, you have, in a classical view, electrons carrying charge with a certain drift diffusion velocity. And the charge current density is just the carrier density times the drift diffusion uh, velocity. In case of spin, as we all know, each electron carries half a Planck constant's angular momentum. It's also quantized. And when you move an electron around, you're at the same time moving this piece of little angular momentum quanta uh, along with the current. That becomes what we call a spin current. Now, mathematically, that's a bit more complex because now you have two vectors to deal with. One is the propagation direction of the current. One is the polarization direction of spin, as opposed to charge is a scalar quantity. Spin is a vector, pseudo vector quantity. So this is a rank two tensor. Uh, depending on where you dot product into, in one case, you pick up the polarization direction. In the other direction, you pick up the current propagation direction. So that's just a very basic sort of descriptive language for us to consider spin current versus charge current. It is a vector uh, quanta, but otherwise it's a very similar quantity. It's still, in this case, within the context of what I'm talking about, uh, carried by and large by, electron, by, by conduction electrons in the solid state conductor. There are other mechanisms for carrying spin current, but I'm not going to get into details on that today. And so why spin current is potentially or realistically interesting for technology um, is you can use spin current's interaction with a, a magnetic entity such as a nanoferromagnet uh, to, to do your magic about memory and switching because the ferromagnet sitting in a energy potential can remember whether my moment points to North Pole or South Pole. That's a zero or one state. That's a memory element. And the spin current, if you're interacting with a ferromagnet through angular momentum conservation, uh, you can drive the moment either towards the North Pole or the South Pole. Uh, therefore, you have a local mechanism to manipulate the, uh, the spin structure of a ferromagnet. And for memories to be competitive today, and you must have all heard the transistors we're talking about as a two, three, five, seven nanometers kind of length scale. And the memories has generally to live in a space no larger than a few tens of nanometers all told with circuit supporting everything. So, so we're talking about tiny little structures. And the spin current, in this case, gives you a localized, uh, localizable control mechanism, to, just like charge current. Now you can use wires to contact these nanomagnets and individually address them. That's the particular strength of spin current as opposed to use, say, magnetic field to write a bit, which is common in, say, disk drives and whatnot. You can still write very small bits, but relatively speaking, it's still a, a uh, dipolar German magnetic field has a certain decay length that's much longer, generally speaking. You have to be careful. And it involves mechanical movement. In this case, it can be completely electrically controlled and localized. So that's why with the advance of uh, the ability to generate and propagate spin current, all these uh, memory-related solid-state technologies take a hold. So how does this actually work? 
physics-wise. Um, it's, as I say, a angular momentum conservation-related story, and Gang's already alluded to, thanks to um, John Slonjewski's early uh, insight way back into the 80s, actually. This is the first concrete device physics uh, paper publication, but his theory actually uh, it was fairly complete by late 80s. It was already understood all the, all the quantitatives of this particular set of dynamics. And the gist of it is, these are the references here, you can go read it, I'm not gonna go into great details of it, but the gist of it is basically the angular momentum conservation between a ferromagnet, which is, by the way, also just an angular momentum on a charged particle. In the classical world, you think of an electron as a spinning charge that carries a certain circular current that gives you both angular momentum from the mass and the circular current gives you magnetic moment. But of course, quantum mechanics says that's a fundamental particles attribute. It's quantized to uh, h bar over two. Uh, that, you learn it in fundamental physics classes, but the classical picture nevertheless still applies in the sense that, that you're, you're dealing with an entity with angular momentum and the magnetic moment that's tied together. And the ratio of the two is what people call the gyromagnetic ratio. Um, nevertheless, so in this case, you have electrons carrying these angular spin, moment, uh, uh, spin uh, component or magnetic moment propagating in a conductor in this case. And once they get into a ferromagnet, they can interact with the ferromagnet through the so-called exchange interaction. Um, and, and what that does is essentially it dumps a certain amount of angular momentum into the ferromagnet because now you have a moment-moment interaction. And if your moment is polarized in a certain direction, coming in, not aligned with the ferromagnetic moment, it will get repolarized over time. And eventually, that part of the differential in angular momentum is deposited into the, into the macroscopic order parameter of the ferromagnet. And that way, you essentially get a torque. That's, that's the torque that used to, used to drive the uh, switching of the magnet. And here's a sort of illustration of the orbit. I've been using this chart for quite a while, and uh, I have to confess there's a sign mistake in there. The handiness is wrong, because the gyromagnetic ratio of charge and spin has a minus sign in it. And in this particular numerical uh, cranking, I didn't put that sign in. So this has the wrong uh, chirality. The next slide will have the right one. But, so, um, but otherwise, all the physics are, are perfectly uh, symmetric. It's just that handiness you have to be careful about. <clears throat> all right, so is there something that I do here that turns the screen off? OK, I'll, I'll try to be nice. <laughs> So both in charge and spin currents are present in this new class of devices that Gang mentioned about uh, we sort of together developed over the, in the 90s um, called a magnetic tunnel junction. Namely, if you have a sort of spin polarized band structure in a ferromagnetic conductor as a tunnel electrode, then the density of states at the Fermi level of these two, what we call uh, majority and the minority bands are usually different. And if you go back to the basic solid state physics transport uh, picture, the tunneling conductance is a essentially uh, evanescent state related to these Fermi surface level uh, electronic uh, structures, uh, particularly density of states. In a naive sort of uh, tall barrier limit, uh, the conductance is just a product of the initial state uh, density of states and that of the final state density of states. So in this case, your majority band tunnels into the majority band, that's one branch, and the majority band can also tunnel into the minority band, that's another branch, um, and, and same as the minority band. So, so there are these different combinations of subband conductance, tunnel conductances. When you add it together, the total tunnel current turns out to have a, because of the quantum mechanical rejection of this, of this main polarization vector, you have a angular dependence. So that angular dependence meaning even if you give, means if you give it a constant voltage bias, your total transport charge current is gonna be different depending on how you, your moments of the electrodes align. That's what people call magneto resistance. In one direction, your resistance is mixed maximal. In the other direction, it's minimal. And so that's, you can use it to, to sense the magnetic orientation of the two electrodes, relatively speaking. Um, and then there's also spin current because all the subband conduction at the same time as I described to you, the electrons carry spin, except that in this case, it's a bit more complicated because now you have four different spin orientations. You have to quantum mechanically uh, preserve the, the rotation. 
um, net net, if you pick a quantum mechanic, well, pick a, a, a particular magnetization direction, call it the North Pole, then, then you can again sum up all the subconductances. In this case, is the conductances for the spin current, not charge. The forms are different, but it has a similar, in the end, a current expression. Uh, not the same, not the same as the charge current, but there is a, there's a relationship between the two. So what does that bring us? That brings us a lot of new, uh, both new physics and new application. The magnetoresistance piece was known, as Gang Xiao said, Professor Xiao said, earlier, in, uh, uh, predicted by Johnson and Zhusky way back in the 70s, and a room temperature demonstration was done in the mid 90s. Immediately after that, it's been very aggressively pursued for magnetic field sensing applications. Uh, one sort of concrete example in the early days was the uh, read head of magnetic uh, disk drives where you can, you can use the tunnel junction to read all the bits as it runs underneath the sensor. Uh, and also more recently, these are, uh, they're, they're, they're finding a lot of applications in, in, in uh, mechanical motion trans trans transduction to, to read the positions in many moving parts. So in the modern automobile, even before Tesla, these things are already find their way into it. And nowadays, just everything's gone exponential. So there are many applications for readout. The key is, as I said earlier, to use the uh, so-called tunnel magneto resistance or the resistance contrast to sense the relative rotation of the ferromagnetic moments. And in practice, you can, so, so to speak, use material science tricks to pin one of the layers so the moment would not be so sensitive to the field. It tend to stay in one place and let the other layers moment to be more responsible, uh, responsive to the applied field. In that case, you can you can cause a relative rotation by applying, uh, sensing the environmental magnetic field, and that's how these things work. So that's the charge current and tunnel magneto resistances. Um, the other piece, of course, as I say, is the same tunnel current carries spin current. Okay. Please. <laughs> so the same mechanism carries spin current, and the spin current, it turns out, is important through this angular momentum conservation business, directly switch one of the magnetic layers of your tunnel junction if it's small enough on the order of 100 nanometer or less. And that has important application consequences. Here, what I'm showing you, there's something I can do on this. Um, so here I'm showing you a sort of current voltage characteristic of a magnetic tunnel junction containing a uh, layer design such that one of the layers can be switched by the spin current. So here you see uh, in one direction, I can switch from the anti-parallel, which is usually the high resistance state, into the parallel or the low resistance state. And if you uh, bias your voltage on the other direction, you can switch from the parallel state back into the anti-parallel state. So that's what these spin currents do in the magnetic tunnel junction, and that's the circuit uh, functionality that enabled a uh, whole new gener a whole new type of solid state memory, namely these magnetic uh, random access memories. Here is a typical sort of representative case of a memory cell. You have one transistor and one magnetic tunnel junction. The transistor is responsible for connecting this tunnel junction to periphery circuits that can apply this voltage. If you apply a large voltage in one direction, you write a one. In the other direction, you write a zero. And if you apply a voltage below the threshold, you don't disturb the state, but you can still sense the resistance difference between the zero and one, and that's a read operation. So both of these can be accomplished by this uh, two terminal magnetic tunnel junctions and with a selection transistor that gives you an address, basically depending on the X and Y coordinate, one is called a word line, one is called a bit line, which one you choose, a combination of voltages turns on that transistor and addresses that particular bit. So that's what the spin current enables, is this switching mechanism. Um, now, spin current can also be generated by, uh, this is a more recent sort of development, even more recent, meaning perhaps over a decade ago, the original physics uh, discussion comes in even earlier, but more device discussion picks up the speed uh, in the 2010s. So what is a uh, spin hole effect or spin orbit interaction? It's basically to say that if you have a spin polarized current propagating through your conductor, um, then a spin-orbit interaction will preferentially deflect 
one flavor of the carrier in one direction and another flavor of the carrier in the other direction if you have a spin up band and a spin down band. Net net, you will get a cross transverse flow of spin current but no charge current because the charge current cancel each other but because of the sign flip of the spin polarization, the spin current add together. So that lateral transport is very similar to the conventional charge Hall effect, but this is in, for spin, and that's why they call it the spin Hall effect, and it's mediated by spin orbit interaction. I, again, I'm not gonna get into details of that. Uh, just to show you a graphic representation of that, if you have a conductor as this illustrated here, say imagine um, tungsten or platinum or any heavy Z systems that has a lot of spin orbit interaction, then there will be a preferred spin orientation accumulation on those interfaces because of this lateral transport. If my charge current here in blue is going in and out of the plane, uh, then the spin current is gonna go laterally wrap around the surface of this conductor. And if you have a ferromagnet or some other things on the interface to collect that spin current, then the spin current can be pulled out and do the same trick as the tunnel junction spin current does on nanomagnets for, for switching them. And indeed, that's what happened. Uh, you can use the spin core induced spin current to switch a nanomagnet too. In this case, was demonstrated by uh, Lu Chao and uh, at Cornell with Berman and Dan Rolf's group there. Uh, again, ten years ago now. Um, that here it shows is the uh, is the tunnel junction that they built on top of this spin orbit material. So they use this particular interface to collect the spin current which switches the bottom layer and the top layer is magnetically fixed. So they use the tunnel junction to read out the resistance change. And one polarity of the charge current, your spin current um, drives the resistance to the low state which means it's a parallel and in the other direction it's anti-parallel. It's almost the same as in the tunnel junction case except here your charge current is going in the channel, the so-called channel downstairs has nothing to do with the transport in the tunnel junction per se. So, so yes, it happens, and the spin current generated by SOT can also switch a nanomagnet. Um, so, uh, but you say, okay, so you have many mechanisms that you can generate spin uh, current. Why particularly bother SOT? Isn't tunnel junction simpler and better? Yes, to a large degree for technology, the simpler the better. Two terminals definitely better than if you have to put a third electrode on to drive the channel current. But there's a relatively fundamental concern with tunnel junction, namely you're relying on electron propagation. Um, each electron carries one H bar over two or one Bohr magneton, right? So there's a ceiling how much charge current can be converted into spin current. One electron, one Bohr magneton max. And that torque is shared by both the free layer and the reference layer, as John Slonjewski understood way back from the 80s. It's a bit of a subtle thing, actually, but if you read through John's paper, it's there. And, and we confirmed it in more ways than one. So net net, if you want to ask how much angular momentum I can pick up on the free layer, which I care about to switch, is one charge unit in electrons give you maybe 0.5 in Bohr magnetons. That's the maximum conversion rate. Whereas SOT, a spin orbit torque, for two things. One is it's a, it's a, it's a scattering-based process, and there is no such fundamental limit in how big a uh, transverse deflection has to be. So the conversion between the charge current and spin current is not fundamentally capped at one half of Bohr magneton. Although practically, say how strong your spin orbit interaction can be before you get driven into these topological insulators and whatnot, there, there are a bunch of really uh, advanced materials properties, people are still having fun understanding it. And the other piece is importantly for application like this is that because you're collecting current density and converting current density into spin current density is in geometrical leverage. Usually the, the, the channel material is very thin. You can get very high current and charge current densities like four or five, 10 to minus, uh, 10 to plus seven M square centimeter quite easily. Um, and that is with the thickness converted when you deflect sideways, you're converting charge current density into spin current density, and you pick up an area leverage by the diameter over the thickness. This is typically a fairly big number. Even for a 30 nanometer tunnel junction, a thickness of a couple of nanometers, you're talking about more than 10x of leverage. So the combination of these two factors, meaning is, is there's at least this promise to say that SOT can potentially give you much better charge current to spin current conversion ratio, much better than 0.5. And why is that important? Um, 
Why is that important? I'll get to it. Um, but there's a problem with SOT. Um, coming back to this picture, if you sort of paid attention earlier, the spin current has two directions. One is the propagation direction of the spin current, which I know what I need in this sort of geometry. I need it to propagate through the channel currents interface into the ferromagnets. So that direction is fixed. And charge propagation direction is also fixed, that you need to have the current going through the channel. Given these two directions, it's for, for simple spin orbit interaction, the polarization of the spin current is also fixed in direction by the, rent, by the vector product rule. So it's lying always in the plane of that interface. And therein lies a lot of potential trouble. Because if you notice in this demonstration uh, of experiment, they're switching a magnetic structure with a moment that is in plane. Um, that's easy because uh, this is in the so-called collinear structure. I'm going to get into details why collinear is so important. Uh, but just, just to remember, collinear is, is a much more preferred direction for spin current induced switching than otherwise. Um, but in the spin current case, the polarization is always in the plane, but the magnetic moment for high density spin memories, especially the modern days, as I say, the junctions are, you need a footprint of 30 nanometers or thereabout or even smaller. Um, you often need a tunnel junction that has the magnetic moment polarized perpendicular to the plane. And the reason you need that in, the, in a very simple uh, argument is at least there are three reasons. One is you need very high anisotropy density. So even when you shrink down to 30, 20, 10 nanometers, you can still have an anisotropy field up and down to support uh, 10 years of data retention. If I'm at zero, and at one, I'm not getting kicked all over the places by thermal fluctuation, KT, 26 millivolts. Uh, rule of thumb from storage world is if you want to maintain 10-year data retention, the energy barrier differentiating the up and down has to be, separating the up and down, has to be at least 40 KT. If you work out the, uh, the Gaussian distributions and edges, this number is more likely to come out to be like 50 or 60 KT, depending on the details. So, so that argues that you need high energy density, and that's only achievable through um, engineered anisotropies, which is usually easier to do for perpendicular than for in-plane. Um, when people use in-plane anisotropy, they use the magnetic shape as usually the predominant force for driving anisotropy. And that has a very practical energy limit. It cannot reach much better than 100 nanometers in size. Below that, it just doesn't work. It's not stable enough. That's one reason. Uh, the other reason is you need to have reduced, reduced switching current. Um, and, and perpendicular anisotropy gives you a simpler energy landscape that there's only one energy scale to worry about, and that is the energy barrier height, directly driven by the anti-damping or collinear spin current. I'm going to explain why that is. And this, uh, I'll come back to say, is critical because you wanted this structure to fit into a transistor cell and the transistor is tiny, so you cannot afford an arbitrary amount of current. This is very stringently controlled by technology. And the third point is more practical, namely, if you wanted to do a uh, perpendicular anisotropy structure, the shape needs to be just simply a circle or roughly close to be a circle. Whereas if you do in-plane anisotropy, you need to control the shape of the magnet very, very precisely to control the anisotropy, which is hugely demanding and different from what a standard semiconductor technology is familiar with. So, so all these argue for a perpendicularly magnetic tun uh, magnetized tunnel junction if we want to integrate it into the back end of CMOS to the advanced node for commercial applications. Um, and, and therein you see the problem with SOT. Uh, I have a spin polarization that's almost perpendicular to the moment. And that is uh, not an ideal geometry for low current density switching. I'll explain why. Okay. So before I dive into a bit more details on the, on the angular momentum conservation story, I just want to highlight the conclusion. So at least you remember what, what the results are if you don't follow the math. Um, the, the conclusion is if you switch a magnetic moment with the spin polarization in the same direction as the anisotropy axis, the so-called collinear geometry, the, the, the spin angular momentum conservation is a so-called anti-damping switch. You operate on a force 
that's comparable to the damping of the precession process of the magnet, which is, by definition, a damping constant times the anisotropy field. And damping constant for most good ferromagnets in this context is 0.01 or even 0.001. So you're a factor of 100 or 1,000 times less uh, than the anisotropy field, which is sort of the elastic of the force in the problem. Okay. Whereas if you are using a nearly orthogonal polarization direction with angular momentum conservation and whatnot, you can still switch it if you break the symmetry by an external magnetic field. I know there's a lot of work going on in that context. But even after you do that, you're still forcing the angular momentum conservation related torque to compete directly with the anisotropy field. There is no damping involved in this faster switching mechanism with, with orthogonal structure. So you're within, I mean, you're, you're a factor of 100 or 1,000 away in terms of the amount of current you needed to switch it. Yes, you can switch it, uh, potentially even quite fast, but you need 1,000 times more current. And why does that matter? Because of, again, these Moore's law related real, real world concerns. This is a projection uh, chart I lifted from the um, semiconductor, what, what do we call IRDS, International something, I forgot the whole title, you can Google it up. It's, it's a semiconductor roadmap, basically, for the next decade. And this is the 2021 version. The 2022 version just came out. One of their data table, I plotted here, says in most likelihood, if you project down 10 years, what the transistors in the most, in the most modern logic technology, like uh, CPUs and GPUs and what have you, um, is gonna follow these trends. Uh, so the right current is on the order of 100 microamps and going down a bit in the further uh, smaller size uh, generations. And on top of that, you have a voltage constraint. The CMOS circuits actually operate somewhere below 0.6 volt. So that's the pigeonhole. Whatever new technology we're trying to develop has to fit in. You have to give it full switching characteristics well below 100 microamps. And remember, there's a transistor load resistance on order of 10 kilo ohms, and you're sharing that with a 0.6 volt. So, so that's the boundary condition. Uh, and that's why the 100 microamps and the current, amount of current you need to switch it really, really matters. Okay, so then it gets to the device physics question of how much current is really necessary to switch a nanomagnet in the context of memory. There are two pieces to that puzzle, right? One is, since I say this is the dynamic, uh, magnetic dynamic through angular momentum conservation, it, you can say, ask the question, how much spin current, if I have God's finger to just put in spin current one bit at a time, would be needed to switch a bit? And then the second question is, how efficiently, if I'm using charge current to generate spin current, can my mechanism convert charge to spin? Which comes back to this SOT versus tunnel junction business. So, so these are two aspects I'm gonna drill, spending the next maybe five minutes to drill a little bit deeper into the, uh, the math of it. So as we are all, uh, this is well established, the classical mechanics basically in the angular momentum space uh, for magnetism, this is the so-called landau lifts gilbert equation. If you add the spin torque term, now it's fairly common to call it lg slonjewski equation. Um, what it is, is basically to say that it's a, it's a precession of motion of a, of, of a moment entity, and there are three torque terms on the right. The first is the conservative force, which is the magnetic field that determines the precession frequency. It's usually, this is a fairly high uh, magnitude torque term. It drives the moment to precess at tens of gigahertz, for example, for, for I mean, 2.8 gigahertz per kilogauss, as the rule of thumb. This is a large term, but leave it alone, the orbits will not change. This term does not change the energy state of the orbit. Then there's the next sort of phenological term to say, okay, all nature mechanisms eventually decay with the friction. Um, there are a lot of spin orbit or whatever mechanism you have microscopically that takes care of the, the friction or dissipation. I'll just phenologically lump it all into a coefficient I call it damping. It's kind of like a cue of the resonator, right, in the engineering words. And you just have to make sure the damping uh, in the end closes the cone angle and drives it into the lowest energy state, which is, in this case, uniaxial anisotropy, the north pole or south pole. So that's all understood way back in the 20s and 30s and the sort of basis for ferromagnetic resonance and everything else, people used it for decades. The spin transfer torque based on spin current is the last term which it originates from, from this decoherence of carrier, electron carried uh, spin uh, 
component, if it's uh, interacting with a ferromagnet, in the end, it gives you this vector term. And this is what is the magic. If you sort of do a first order expansion to the LLG equation, you see the damping actually is nm times the dnm dt, which is h cross n. So you get a double vector product out of it, looks just like that. And if it's collinear, you can even pull the unit vector out. And that's where the magic happens. It says this term is just like damping. I can either damp it towards the North Pole or I can anti-damp it if the spin current is in the opposite direction and open up the orbit and go to the South Pole. That's the mechanism for anti-damping switching. And if you see the competing terms, it is the spin current here, normalized against normal total magnetic moment, of course, because it's an angular momentum process. It measures against the total amount of moment you have in the nanomagnet. And then there's a damping term. That's where it comes in. That's why this spin torque is balanced against alpha times this whole H business instead of directly balancing against H. So if you're not in the, if it's in the collinear situation, it's very simple. This term is directly balancing the damping torque. If it is not in collinear structure, um, also I already explained that. So, so this is essentially to say when I have enough spin current, so my effective damping of the system goes to zero which means it doesn't damp anymore. And if you go slightly beyond that, it's anti-damping, or in other words, amplifies your precession until you go to the southern hemisphere when the sign changes and settles into the south pole. So that's how the switch happens, and there is a damping prominently proportional sitting in the threshold current calculation. That's when everything is collinear. The math works out very cleanly, very nicely. If it is not collinear, it's a, first a little bit counterintuitive, but if you go through the analysis, there's actually a one over cosine of the non-collinear angle worked into the threshold current. And in other words, there's only the collinear component of the spin current that contributes to the anti-damping. The other piece doesn't count for the, first to, for, the, for, for the leading order. And that already gives you a hint. If you're not aligned up, you're costing you more current to switch. So that's fundamentally the problem if you have these non-collinear spin arrangements. But that's, uh, that's a, just a description of the, of the threshold that needs to switching the bit. In real technology world, you need to switch it, you need to switch it fast, and you need to switch it reliably. And that usually means you need to give it more spin current. The amount of spin current you need to give it on top of the threshold is, again, directly proportional to the angular momentum of the system. You can almost think of the threshold current as a description of the spin leakage current. You need to put more spin current into it than it leaks out through damping for it to reverse. So the first order business is you have to give it more spin current, like a leaky bucket with a bullet hole in it. You have to fill it faster than it drains out. And then how fast you fill it is the net difference afterwards. And that's the fundamental reason why the faster you want to switch it, the more current you need to give it. The other piece is this whole thing is actually becoming a statistical process at finite temperature because at zero temperature, and if you're really sitting exactly at the North Pole, in the collinear geometry, there is no spin torque. It's a double vector product. And if it's everybody's lined up, it's zero. You have to have a finite angle for getting it started. And the further away that finite angle is, the faster it can initiate this precession. Um, in, so it, it, this is what in typical sort of mechanics is, is, is an unstable balancing point. Uh, and of course, our memories operate at room temperature, 300 Kelvin, and this initial state is thermally distributed. So you always have a initial angle. And let's say this is the initial angle's distribution function. And as we describe by the uh, dynamics, you can read the references. The larger the angle, the faster it switches. The smaller the angle, the slower it switches, the longer time it takes. So you can map the angular distribution into a switching speed distribution. So the switching becomes a probabilistic process. You have, switch, you have possibilities for, for rare events when it takes a long time for it to diffuse out of the North Pole, and then you have other situations when it switches very quickly. And the more current you give it, the more quickly everybody switches. So you can invert this relation to a current dependence, how probable it is to switch. There is this one over uh, time, switching time dependence. Again, it's a reflection of angular momentum conservation with the moment sitting as a slope uh, in this, in this in this relationship, but it's most likely to switch at a certain current for a certain time. And the more you want it to switch reliably, 
the more current you have to give it to the other side of the Gaussian. And, uh, and the faster you want to switch it, the more current you need to give it. So there's this complex relationship. In an experiment, what do you do? Is you measure the switching probability as a function of right current. That if you plot the probability on the log scale, it turns out you can work out the math that there is a log linear dependence of the switching or the reversal probability or not reversal probability as a function of the drive force, which in this case is the charge current or spin current rather, but it's converted from the charge current. It's a log linear relationship. And the faster you want it to switch, the shorter pulse you have to switch it. This is a pulse to switch. If, you, I give a, if I give a five nanosecond pulse, for example, it is one curve. If I give it a ten, uh, one nanosecond pulse, it takes more. Uh, current. It's again angular momentum argument that you can either give me all that all at once with more current or you can puzzle it out a little more but over longer, a little less current but over longer time. So that's the fundamental of this log linear. Okay, so um, this is relatively fundamental physics and it can be understood to the zeroth order with this so-called a simple macro spin picture which we did way back in the 2000s. Um, and we looked at it with our technology people, and this is marginally doable. Uh, back then, of course, we're not at uh, tens of seven nanometer transistors, and so 100 microamps might be okay. Um, even though that is still fairly edgy, it's not clear whether technology-wise it's gonna happen or not, but we went ahead and did it anyway, trying to optimize it, and through it, this is one of the biggest happy surprises I've seen over this research, namely, if you use your single macro spin model for, this is an actual device measured error uh, characteristic. Here's the tunnel junction voltage across. And what I'm showing you here in different branches are the switching error probabilities as a function of pulse width. As predicted, more or less qualitatively at least, the, the, the shorter the right pulse is, the faster you want it to switch, the more voltage, or in other words, more current you need to give it. So, so that fits to our understanding. What's surprising is if you take the materials parameters to the best of your knowledge and you crank through the equation, you get this dashed yellow line of the uh, uh, log linear dependence. But in, realist, in real data for the same parameter, you're comparing this with the black curve here. And you notice it does have a little bit lower threshold in the ideal uh, physical case uh, if you use the single spin as the model. But what happened in the real world is in, instead of uh, you're paying a little bit more for the threshold, but once you exceed the threshold, the switching occurs at a much sharper slope than you would expect from macro spin by at least a factor two, not more. It's that factor two made technology possible, surprisingly. It's a, it's a very happy surprise for us that the, the latest pro uh, product generations of, of embedded memories that all live very happily with that factor of two. Otherwise, we'll have to sweat a lot more if ever it's gonna be a reality. So, Interesting good news for technology, but do we understand why? And actually the answer is, in retrospect, hindsight is always 2020, um, is buried in our description already. So if you remember, the residual probability of not switching has to do with this, these little states got stuck in the North Pole. They have zero angular momentum torque. They have zero spin torque and takes a little thermal diffusion time for them to come out. And the thing with macro spin, the simple model, is there is one universal direction. That's the North Pole. And, and so therefore you have a very well-defined set of ground state. Whereas if in a real ferromagnetic metal system at finite temperature, even at 30 nanometers, it's not a single spin. It has thermal fluctuations that's not entirely coherent. In other words, one part of the sample could be sitting at a North Pole, but your probability of having the other part of the sample also sitting at the North Pole is significantly less. And depending on how you play with the materials parameters, you can optimize these competitions so that you capture this incoherent dynamics to make it almost impossible for the system to have a global stagnation point as North Pole. In other words, there's always a part of sample you can switch first. And, and that's fundamentally the reason why you wind up with having a much steeper switching characteristic than a simple sort of uh, linearized LLG would predict. 
that's one bit of a happy surprise to me, actually, coming out of complexity. The magnetism usually is complex beyond comprehension most of the time. And when, when something works, you really want to understand what the heck is going on. And, and this is a happy, happy outcome. So, so there's a lot to be gained in understanding nonlinear dynamics. And I'm happily encouraged by that. Um, so there are other stuff. I think I'm short of time, so I'm not going to get into great details. Uh, I'm just going to show you the progress a little bit, sort of. Uh, here is what we showed happily. Uh, the first example way back in 2015, 2016, that we, oh yes, excitingly have one single junction that can perform down to switching errors below 10 to minus 9 with a voltage. Uh, at, at back then it was 10 nanosecond, and at a voltage that we don't break the junction down, at least not right away. That's one junction. And after a lot of dollars in the sweats, um, 2020, here is 4,000 junctions. They all switch in more or less down to 10 to minus 7 with this kind of distribution we're looking at. This is, uh, yeah, so this is 3 nanosecond switching. This is 10 nanoseconds. So that's what the incremental technology and materials improvement did. Quite impressive. Uh, I was, again, happily surprised that this happened. And this gives the foundation to a lot of the success nowadays for, for embedded backend tunnel junctions based as GTM RAM. Now, further down the road, as I say, a single magnetic tunnel junction spin polarization is capped at about 0.5. And it actually turns out if you're reasonably symmetric in tunnel junction, this conversion rate is related to the tunnel magneto resistance in a, in a square root fashion. And we're actually already very close to it. We're like 0.48 or 0.49 with a couple hundred percent type of MR. So this number is optimized to the max with the current configuration. It's not too much you can expect. You can even increase your MR by tenfold. This number won't increase much. So there has to be some other tricks to play. One is, uh, okay, so you say one filtering step with the tunnel barrier can give you about 0.5. What if I put another barrier? And if you can double filter it, naively you argue, at least you can pick up another factor of two. If you, all your stars line up, you may even pick up more. But that, we, we, let's not go there. That asks too much of nature. But the factor of two is reasonable, and we actually implemented it. And two within reason, we demonstrated that you can indeed get another close to factor of two of gain in spin polarization. What that means is you can switch at the same speed with more or less the same error rate, but half the current, which is sweet music for integration because the transistor really don't want to work that hard. <clears throat> so this is our IEDM demonstration of 2021. I think we, all just, we just also had one last December. I, this is a year old. <clears throat> so it's an interesting journey from John's original sort of insight, I think, uh, way back in the 70s and 80s about the spin angular momentum conservation related to magnetic uh, torque on the, on the tunnel electrodes to some earlier demonstrations in tunnel junctions that we flipped around a dozen times before it died and taken it another year or two to reproduce to now we can make them gazillions of time. They all do the same thing. And to actually package the chips. And by the way, IBM's already using these chips as a... Um, as a, a pipeline memory into the permanent storage uh, as, as, a, as a safety precaution because these high reliability systems, they want to deal with power outages and they don't want you to lose data. So everything pipes into the uh, solid state memory has this uh, fast SDT memory. I think they're using the global uh, chips as a, as a buffer memory mechanism. And like I said earlier, these, these uh, low power integrated embedded memories are starting to come online. So these are real commercial operations already. So quite, quite interesting and, and, and satisfying a journey for 20 years, I guess. Um, and then these are new applications already on the horizon, talked about uh, faster embedded memories, go beyond fl e -f embedded flash. How about SRAM replacement? It's being talked about, not in product yet, but give us a little more time. Um, there are also a lot of discussion on uh, nonlinear oscillators and networks that works into the neural network world using uh, spin as a dynamic, these nonlinear dynamics as, as an oscillator mechanism. You can also use these nonlinear dynamics for neuron synapse simulation. Um, and you can also use these fluctuating tunnel junctions for controlled random number generation. So these, I'm going to sort of pretty much just skip. I'll just very quickly mention spin orbit torque could, could potentially be another mechanism to enhance switching speed by giving you more spin current. 
Even more promising is if you can combine spin torque together with spin transfer torque in the tunnel junction sense, um, then you wind up with still having a two terminal device, easy on the circuit people, but you can get faster performance and better. But this uh, requires a lot of innovation that is still happening, namely, how do you use spin torque, spin orbit torque related mechanism to create a spin polarization that is really perpendicularly polarized. And at the same time, you want the conversion rate to be better than a tunnel junction. Those are tremendously uh, challenging materials and also device design concepts that we're still wrapping our heads around. Um, and also, whatever new materials you come up with has to be uh, compatible to the commercial CMOS infrastructure, which people put hundreds of billions of dollars into it, they ain't gonna change it just for STTM RAM. So we'll have to fit our pigeons into that hole. So that's where we are. The last thing I want to talk a little bit about is this to use tunnel junction as a random number generator. That's a new direction for computing. It's been seeing some uh, momentum from, say for example, this is from Purdue's group, Supriyo Dada's paper. Where what they're proposing is to use the magnetic tunnel junction. We've been talking so far all about memory, but the other extreme works too. You can, you can make use of KT, which kicks the magnetic moment all over the places randomly and say, okay, I got a random dynamics happening on a device that I can happily convert that into electrical signal. So now I have a, a physically generated entropy stream that I can digitize and inject it into uh, CMOS logic circuits. There's a lot of applications for that for computing and for cryptography and for many other things. So this is potentially a uh, new class of devices that we're exploring. One of the earlier topics that was, uh, since you want to be integrated into the CMOS and we all know they're clocking at a couple of gigahertz easily. Can the magnetic tunnel junction fluctuate sufficiently fast to match the clock cycle, at least to be in the right neighborhood? And that was one of the earlier uh, discussions we had with the Purdue group. One of the physics piece coming out of this is yes, you can, but not with uniaxial anisotropy. In this case, you do want to have easy plane anisotropy because in that case, your moment is forced in the plane, but the time scale is still more or less governed by the energy, uh, easy plane energy scale. So you can have four pi mass that's on the order of a Tesla and the thing is just basically spinning in the plane, but with sufficiently fast autocorrelation numericals say it can be well below a nanosecond. So that was the modeling and a couple of papers we wrote together with the Purdue group. And uh, last year, or two years ago now, um, one of our postdocs here actually uh, put, I mean, we made some of these junctions through our MREM fab line, and they're you know, 30, 50 nanometer-ish junctions. Easy plane round circle, instead of making them perpendicular, just take away the perpendicular anisotropy, let them fluctuate in, in plane. And he demonstrated here with actual benchtop measurements that you can get a uh, couple of nanosecond type of autocorrelation in terms of fluctuation. And, and so this whole understanding of easy plane allowing you to have very fast fluctuation rate, at least to the zeroth order, has some experimental proof. Uh, of course, going beyond that is where the hard work begins. There are a lot of other optimization topics we need to go through, but I'm not gonna have time to get, any, get into any of that. So let me just wrap up the uh, description very quickly. We have products already on the market based on STT tunnel junctions. Um, more is underway, including novel mechanisms such as SLT, but there are a lot of major challenges to overcome. And there are also new areas of applications beyond memory, such as probabilistic computing, which works into actually artificial intelligence. A lot of the machine learning algorithms could use that. So let me just stop here and maybe take a few questions. Why cobalt iron? Your um, the you use the cobalt iron and boron, right? Uh, why can't you use cobalt samarian? Good question. I can't say we've tried that, right? Uh, is, is it compatible? Uh, the there are some is, very fundamental materials reasons why cobalt iron boron particularly came out, and that is a lecture by itself. But in a jest. What it turns out is you need, for, for these very high tunnel magneto resistances, it's mm. actually a tricky business. You need the MGL to be cubic 001 oriented against the ion 001. That's when the, the, the density of state contrast is maximal. Your EB is a f 48 uh, kBT. That's one electron volt, right? Roughly. 
Okay. What? And then, so you, if you replace it with cobalt samarium, you might get a bigger EB. Oh there. no, that's a separate topic. The, the reason to use cobalt ion is primarily not because of anisotropy considerations, but anisotropy is important. You, that's another lesson that all the numbers have to come together, just not one thing. But the primary reason to use cobalt ion borons for large magneto resistance. Okay. And the reason for mag large magneto resistance is you need to have actually a cobalt ion 001 on MgO 001 texture at the interface. And how do you achieve that? It's actually a, a, a material science lecture. They go in as amorphous deposition. These are room temperature deposited. And then you anneal. And MGO has the property of, if your surface is smooth enough, you throw it on, it's always nanocrystal, and it is always edge on edge, 001. So it nucleates that interface symmetry for you to get large TMR. That's the first order business for, for, for these tunnel junctures to have very large MR. But that's a good question. The Sumerian uh, is one possibility, but at the interface, it wrecks that mechanism. So there's, there are other considerations. The other aspect is you have to also, for, for spin torque transition, remember there's a damping term in the magnetic layer. So if you use rare earth and stuff, you have to be careful to make sure the damping's not too big. Otherwise, you jack up the threshold current. <clears throat> oh yeah, we dump half the element table in that layer. Tried everything. <laughs> <laughs> So you benchmark the SRAM. Uh, I understand that you are comparing the performance at room temperature, correct? So uh, let's say the real estate and the energy and the speed. In the end, what's your conclusion? So your question is, if you benchmark these memories, excuse me, against SRAM, where, what, the, the energy and speed metric, how do they compare? And the real estate or the size. Right, so the size, as I said, these are the typical product that we're offering on the order of somewhere between 30 and 50 nanometers, depending on who you speak to and which technology they're talking, in terms of the, the cell size, right? SRAM is six transistors, so it's quite a bit bigger in footprint, right? Even with the most advanced technology. So, so in that sense, real estate-wise, they are not too far away with each other. Ride current is a challenge, but surprisingly, the total ride power is not tremendously different either uh, if you amortize the operation. The transient power is very high. You need, let's say, 50 microamps to ride a bit, but you only give that for two nanoseconds, right? That's your ride speed. The rest of the time, this thing is, this thing is, is, is not volatile. You don't need power to maintain that bit, whereas SRAM, even if you, uh, I mean, you can reduce the power to maintain a bit state, but you need to power it constantly. This thing, you just write it once and forget it. Okay. Then my second question would be, uh, at low enough temperature, DRAM is uh, more or less like SRAM. So we know the energy gain or, or reduction. How does your device scale with temperature in terms of energy? Very good question. I don't know a s experimental answer to that. We haven't done it. I know there were separate programs looking at low temperature memories and stuff. Um, I wouldn't expect it to be prohibitively different, especially if you start to consider these non-macro spin situations when the dynamics can be localized to the portion of the sample nucleation and then you sweep it across. Um, it, but that's, that's my imagination, and, and this sort of thing, to really benchmark it, you have to do it. Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> Any other question? I just have a little question here. You were talking about the, the, the fact that you, you switch it where you be stuck sometimes, and you have to easily. Is it an opportunity? You think you have some circuit where you have multiple? Uh, multiple cells together and then you selectively can program some of them and not others? Jonathan, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question is, you, you, you said there, there might be uh, probabilities that your bit can get stuck and not switch when you try to write it. Can you use that property by selectively uh, choose multiple bits and write some and not others? Uh, we have to think a little more about whether that's random or Right. I mean, uh, you probably have an application in mind that I, I'm, I'm not in full sync with yet. 
Uh, yeah, so, so there is a underlying uh, probabilistic process. That's stochastic. That's, that's KT driven. That's not anything physical. I mean, it, it, that's not anything algorithm. It, it's, it's real physical driven probability. So, so how to capitalize on that? Yes, we are thinking about all kinds of possible applications for it. How controllable they are from device to device, from operation to operation, whether they drift and this and that, there's a lot of real world issues. But yes, in principle, this opens up another can of worm about using its probabilistic properties as a, as a circuit element. I think that's, if that's what you're, you're, you're driving at, agree. There's potentially a lot of opportunities there. Yeah. Sarah. Um, and this might be outside of the scope of this talk, but I was wondering if there were any other uh, material spin textures that you think are promising candidates for integration and backend, like skirmionic materials. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, research work going on in many different fields, and it's been always like that. Uh, and what gets into the back end is a little bit Darwinistic in the end. Everything has to come together. And, and the company always asks us, how much money can you make for us at the end of the day? <laughs> so A, it has to work, right? Everything, temperature, budget, density, operating current, all these. Uh, and then B, you have to work through a path that's not really jumping over the hoops to, to, to make it happen. You cannot spend $100 billion on this and say, I gave you $10 million return every year. Nobody's yeah. going to buy that. So, so that's the challenge. There's a lot of new mechanisms being, and materials being proposed and studied. Some of this, I have no doubt, will find their way into the back end. Uh, but in the process, a lot of other things has to come together. And, and in the end, it has to make sense that you're bringing something truly valuable people, especially in the commercial world, that's a very stringent requirement that people appreciate is gonna pay their real dollars for it. <clears throat> so every year, oh, you have another question? Me? Um, yeah, come, hold on one second. Yeah. Um, so in like a MRAM configuration, um, we sent a large current, I guess, through um, a spin valve device that can change the um, orientation of the spin from anti-parallel to parallel or like vice versa. I'm just wondering if there's like a way for us to make the free layer even more free, which means like can it turn at an angle and not just like up and down? Like so, for example, can we, I don't know, stack so there are Another two ways to read. Uh, let me, let me, so, so whether you can make the free layer more free, that it can have multiple directions. I guess so. So, so that that is one school of thought of trying to do multi-bit memories, right? You can settle at North Pole, or maybe crater somewhere in between crater and North Pole, and there's two mm -hmm. bits and such. Yeah, there are ideas being kicked around for that sort of thing. Um, and again, it all the metrics have to come together. Um, Fundamentally, yes, you can, in principle, have multiple states. Actually, we even worked hard to avoid multiple states because you want them to switch only between two states. If you have three, you're in trouble. Uh, but to have three states in a very consistent way with three sigmas and, and enough that you can do a billion times and they all do the same thing, that's a somewhat different proposition. So fundamentally, I agree with you. There are opportunities there. To bring it to the real world takes a bit more. And there might be fundamental uh, physics-related considerations we, we want to look into. Say if you want a KT operating at room temperature, what is the role of temperature in that case? How much broadening is going to get to the adjacent states? How you deal with that? Whether there are any particular trade-offs? Um, and then there are realistic materials issues. How are you going to achieve these intermediate angular dependent uh, positions? It's an interesting topic, I would say, but yeah. It drags in a lot of, we can have it uh, <laughs> for 